Hello! <laughs> Welcome to an adventure. Uh, an archival adventure, that is. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and uh, this is my weekly uh, <laughs> live streamed program where I share items from Special Collections and University Archives with you. Uh, most of the time, I haven't seen them. Uh, so it's sort of like an unboxing, because they're in boxes, and I take them out, and we discover them together, and we talk about what's there. So, huzzah! Um, hopefully you're all having a good day. Um, hopefully the sound is well balanced. Uh, it sounded okay to me, but I have a different experience of it than you do. So, uh, if there is an issue at all with the balance, let me know. I will take care of it. Um, let me say uh, welcome to everybody who has shown up. Uh, and also welcome to everybody who has commented in the chat. Welcome, Obi-Wan Pez, um, Shadows of Life, Key Squared, Iron Trout, uh, Nauseam. Um, yeah, everybody, welcome in. It's good to see you all. Um, we like to start this program by just taking a moment and looking at Virginia Tech's land acknowledgement and labor recognition. Since we are gonna be looking at history, I think it's important that we look at history. <clears throat> so, just bring that up on screen here and 
Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute. And they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Iprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah, for dropping the, um, uh, the corresponding note in chat. Wow, words in brain. Um, I was trying to... I, do that, thank you. But also, thank you, Fluid Ann, for the um, for the resubscription using Prime. 15 months, welcome back. It's good to see you. Um, and indeed, indeed, finding aid. Um, we do have an aid to finding. Uh, let me just make sure that everything is situated so that we are going to um, look at it together at the same time instead of me um, going over there and it not being ready. Uh, so what are we looking at today? <clears throat> today our materials aren't specifically related to the Tudelo and Monacan uh, people or to the history of enslaved persons, um, though we have done those in the past. Today we're looking at recycling because coming up this weekend is Earth Day. Um, Saturday is Earth Day, and so um, we have this collection of records of the Office of the Virginia Tech Recycling Coordinator, Larry Bechtel, uh, spanning 1991 to 2012. Um, the Virginia Tech, like, university archives stuff isn't always the most engaging on stream. I will say, I have seen at least one of the videos and it is interesting. I don't want to spoil it so I'm just going to leave it there and say it's interesting um, <laughs> and it's a fun time. I, we'll look at it. It's a short video uh, but yeah so the abstract here um, so we've got uh, 1.9 cubic feet, two boxes, and an oversized folder. <clears throat> I did not pull the oversized folder. Um, I guess I, maybe, I don't know. It's not here in the room with me. I think I forgot it existed. Uh, <laughs> the records of the Office of Virginia Tech Recycling Coordinator, Larry Bechtel, include correspondence and reports, photographs and slides, four VHS tapes, three floppy disks, recycling logs, and publications and newspaper articles concerning Virginia Tech recycling, and Larry Bechtel's position as its coordinator from 1991 to 2007. Um, I know the photographs will work. I'm ready for slides. I did not have time to digitize any of the VHS tapes, so those are out for today. Um, the floppy disks, however, I have the contents from, uh, and those included some videos already. Um, but yeah, I think it should be interesting to, to review. Let's see here, we have um, 
a little bit of history on Virginia Tech recycling itself. <clears throat> VTR was started in 1991 by the physical plant as a part of Facilities Services Office of Energy and Sustainability, Virginia Tech Recycling provides recycling services to Virginia Tech. Initially, VTR provided campus-wide aluminum can recycling services, eventually expanding to collect corrugated cardboard, sorted office paper, glossy magazines and catalogs, newspapers, and commingled materials. Uh, Larry Bechtel served as VTR's first coordinator from 1991 through 2007. Bechtel is also a professional sculptor and made the statue of William Addison Caldwell on Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus. In prepping for the stream, I did not see that note, or I would already have a picture of that statue prepared to show you. <clears throat> I can pull it up relatively quickly, but interesting. Uh, the records, so I, I, I'll also need to tell you about William Addison Caldwell in, in that case, but we'll do that really briefly. Um, photographs and slides, VHS, floppies, four books, a number of reports and newspaper articles. Describe, the, the reports describe its goals, budgets, and events. It also includes a personal account of the progression of VTR by Bechtel, a daily log of the program ranging from 91 to 94, and several memos sent and received during his position as coordinator. Um, and so, of course, you can see uh, it's been arranged into four series here, audiovisual materials and photographs, correspondence, reports, articles, and published materials, and administrative documents. And then, uh, there's a breakdown by container that will tell you box number and folder number. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is box two, folder five. I know it says box folder two, folder five. It's box two, folder five. Uh, and then below that, it tells you what is in that box, um, which box two, folder five is landfill snapshots, gamma, beta, phi, soil and water conservation slash Earth Day. Um, so you're free to peruse through the finding aid if you see something that stands out to you and you're like, oh, this sounds interesting. I'd really like to see this. Uh, let me know and I'll make sure that I share it on stream and we can talk about it together. Um, if not, I will pick some things that seem interesting and we'll look at them. Uh, but I should have everything unless it says just like folder one, uh, which would refer to the oversized folder that I don't have in the room with me. Because I forgot that it had an oversized folder. That said, um, I'm... I'm going to share with you the statue that Larry Bechtel apparently made apart from his job as, um, you know, Virginia Tech Recycling Coordinator. Uh, oh, geez. Wrong keyboard. Forgot which computer I was controlling for a moment. Um, All right, so you can see here the title of this page, First Student. William Addison Caldwell was the first student to register with uh, Virginia Tech as a student. And um, in 2006, a statue of William Addison Caldwell uh, was dedicated on campus. It has been moved at least once that I know of. It was a gift from the class of 1956. It was installed between the Performing Arts Building and Brody Hall, and then in 2015 it was moved temporarily to the Upper Quad to allow for demolition of Brody Hall and make way for the new Corps of Cadets Residence Hall. It is presently positioned uh, at, like, midway up a set of stairs 
uh, leading up to the Corps of Cadets Residence Hall. Uh, but let me see if I can get this picture bigger or a bigger picture, possibly. Images, we'll go to images. I didn't have like a quick, like, I know, I will go here. Um, but it's an easy to find thing. <clears throat> there we go. So this is the sculpture that was apparently made by our sculptor who created the Virginia Tech Recycling Program, like the first coordinator of the program. Um, I had no idea of that connection. Um, and so here, so there's a story along with the sculpture and along with the student. Um, William Addison Caldwell, Craig County farm boy, Ad Caldwell, walked 26 miles to enroll here in 1872 as the first student. The popular cadet majored in agriculture and worked as a teacher, clerk, and salesman before his death in 1910. Donated by the class of 1956, sculpture by Lawrence Reed Bechtel. I never, I never knew, sorry, about, I'm, that's exciting. Anyway, uh, that's peripheral to Virginia Tech Recycling, which is what we're going to focus on for the rest of today. Um, let me go ahead and do, uh, let's go to the document camera and start looking at materials. How about that? Also, I just realized I could do... I realized I forgot that I was going to be showing um, digital video and that I needed to be prepared for that. Uh, it won't be hard to do, it'll just take me a moment to like wrap my brain around, okay, how does that work with my current setup? Not really a big issue. So let's see, I made, I made like a little like notes sheet for myself. Uh, just to help with like stream uh, so that I would have already gone through and noted, hey, there's a couple of things in here that might be interesting <clears throat> myself. Um, this is the first time I've, I've done that. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to get super distracted, but it does mean that at least I know of a couple of things that seemed like they were interesting. <sighs> we'll start with, here's what the inside of the box looks like. <laughs> because I always think it's good to, you know, share a bit about what you'll encounter if you go to an archives. This is pretty typical. This is a fairly large-ish box. Um, we have smaller ones. Uh, this is a box size that's typically referred to as a banker's box outside of like archives circles. Um, let's see. Trying to remember, because I did look at these, but I didn't write down any of the papers, and I sort of want to start with some of these. Because I wrote down things like videos, one of which I had planned to digitize and I just didn't have the time. So. grab a couple of these things and um, typically if you were working in an archives doing research for yourself you would not want to do what I just did which is pull multiple folders out all at the same time um, I work with these 
all the time. And um, am confident that I can get things back exactly where I took them from. Also, I'm only going to be using each folder one at a time. It's just I needed to like separate them um, from the box so that I could do it better. <laughs> Consilience, thank you. <clears throat> So this folder here is uh, box one, folder 10, environmental coordinator support documents, 1999 to 2007. So we know uh, Larry Bechtel was the first environmental coordinator, the first coordinator for the uh, recycling program here at Virginia Tech. So I'm curious to see exactly what these support documents are. I'm hoping that we'll get some like I'm, I'm hoping to come across like original proposal for doing recycling on campus or something along those lines, but we'll see. <clears throat> so this says uh, CURC 2000 Charlotte, North Carolina. I don't know what CURC is. I'm assuming it is some sort of conference. Uh, if anybody wants to look it up, go ahead. Otherwise, we might find out when we're reading the document, and if we don't, then I can look it up later. Um, establishing a university environmental coordinator position slash office and initiating an environmental council. A progress report from Virginia Tech. So, and at the time he listed his title as Virginia Tech Recycling Coordinator and Solid Waste Manager. Uh, caveat. We have neither an environmental coordinator nor an environmental council at Virginia Tech. And some of you may have one or both on your campus. So I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject and expect that I can learn from you. However, from my years as the VT recycling coordinator and solid waste manager, knowing university operations quite well and having been involved in various efforts to promote environmental stewardship, I am reporting upon the latest concerted attempt to crystallize these efforts through establishment of a formal environmental coordinator position slash office. I hope you find my remarks and our interaction useful. College and University Recycling Coalition, thank you, Key Square. <clears throat> so this is... Um, not about the job he was actually doing. This is about efforts to establish an overall coordinator role and council uh, for environmental stewardship of the Virginia Tech campus. I don't honestly know whether we have one today. Um, I think it's highly likely or possible that we do, but I don't honestly know whether we do. However, I do know we have a university arborist, which I would be thrilled if we had records from the university arborist. I think that that would be amazing to look at those. As far as I know, we don't have them in the archives. If anybody is watching who happens to know the university arborist or anybody in that office, I would love to talk to you about getting those records over here to the archives because it would be amazing. Just do it for the trees. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I find the fact that we have an arborist to be interesting. Uh, and I'm sad I don't have like documents to go through about that. Uh, <clears throat> introduction. At last year's NRC conference in Cincinnati, the establishment of campus environmental coordinator positions slash offices seemed to be an idea whose time had come. I returned from that conference feeling that Virginia Tech was getting behind on this and convinced that if anybody was going to get anything done about the situation, it was going to have to be me. <clears throat> Reservations. I had, and still have, mixed feelings about whether or not I want to be the person to fill an environmental coordinator's position, if one were created. I'm mainly leery of taking on a much larger set of responsibilities without adequate support resources or an appropriate increase in salary. 
most of us as, at least in the realm of recycling, are activists and motivated by altruistic goals rather than financial gain and readily get ourselves into situations where we are doing a lot more work than is, or ever can be, reflected in our paycheck. Furthermore, taking on more work without additional resources or salary will only delay what must be a university commitment <clears throat> backed by the necessary funding. We facilitate continued university neglect of environmental issues by agreeing to address them on our own. I hope this is not a pessimist's view. On the other hand, I am perhaps uneasy about the prospect of an unmitigated success. Suppose Virginia Tech warmly endorsed the idea of an environmental coordinator, picked me to fill the post, opened the coffers, and said, make it happen. What you, whatever you say, we will do. <clears throat> How would I respond? What changes would I implement? Would these changes be of sufficient importance to warrant the resources invested in me? This sounds like the internal monologue of anybody who's proposed a new program at a university. Um, <clears throat> oh, we get some background. This is this is sort of. I, I'm hoping what I was hoping that we would come across. About 1992, <clears throat> Virginia Tech President McComas signed the Tallery's Decl Declaration. President McComas, who passed away a couple of years later, was a, also a true supporter of campus recycling. In 1993, a Tallery's steering committee was established through the provost's office, and letters of selection went out to about 20 people, including me. I have no idea what that word means. Tallery's? Um, and I'm curious. I'm looking that one up. Tallery. Uh, apparently there is a place in France named Tallery. Hey look. A brief history of the Tallery's declaration. An historic attempt to define and promote sustainability in higher education was made in October 1990 with the creation of the Tallery's Declaration. Jean Mayer, the president of Tufts University, convened 22 university presidents and chancellors in Tallery's France to voice their concerns about the state of the world and create a document that spelled out key actions institutions of higher education must take to create a sustainable future. Recognizing the shortage of specialists in environmental management and related fields, as well as the lack of comprehensive or comprehension by professionals in all fields of their effect on the environment and public health, this gathering defined the role of the university in the following way. Quote, universities educate most of the people who develop and manage society's institutions. For this reason, universities bear profound responsibilities to increase the awareness, knowledge, technologies, and tools to create an environmentally sustainable future. Okay, so in 93, or sorry, in 92, the president of the university signed on to that declaration. So two years after it was initially established. <clears throat> 93, a steering committee was made. The invitation was very exciting. I felt that we had at last reached environmental Olympus and could now act with godlike wisdom and authority to transform VT into a marvelous, happy, and environmentally harmonious heaven on earth. Real life is not so kind to idealism, however, and my fond dreams were soon dashed. The chairman, though he had a national reputation for behavioral research related to environmental issues, had no plan, no agenda, and very little commitment to the, to the committee. He was finally asked to resign by remaining members of the committee and an interim chair uh, wound up affairs and closed the committee, which met a total of five times. Wow. Uh, selected members didn't gel into a committee and seemed vaguely puzzled about what they were supposed to be doing. Okay. Fortunately, a grad student had been hired to facilitate proceedings. Brenda procured minutes and arranged meetings with those, uh, er, and these were the threads that held the committee together, and the committee was not a total loss. A university recycling policy statement was approved by the committee and sent to pre 
to President Torgerson for his signature and distribution to all faculty and staff. Um, this was only a qualified success, as many people never saw it, or in the blizzard of other mail, quickly forgot they had seen it. In March 1995, a university working group on Virginia Tech as an environmental role model was established, again through the provost's office, a different provost. This group was much smaller in size than the Tallery's group, five active members versus 15 or so ostensible members, and had a chairman willing to finish the job he was given. Oh wow, there's some tone in this, in this document. And this is apparently like remarks that he was giving at a, at a conference. The working group produced a very credible document in July 95, which recommended that VT develop a university environmental policy statement, undertake an environmental slash energy audit, reward environmental teaching, research, operations, and make these uh, activities known, incorporate environmental goals into campus life, address counterproductive regulatory and administrative procedures, establish a standing committee to implement these goals. So far as I know, there was no formal action taken on any of these recommendations. However, some sectors of the university essentially carried out parts of these recommendations on their own initiative. Residential and dining programs performed an energy audit for residence halls and has been working for some time to replace old windows, install aerated shower heads, and develop a standard recycling trash collection procedures uh, for all students. Uh, physical plant instituted green, a green lights program to replace old high mercury fluorescent lamps, recycle these and replace them with low mercury lamps. A supervisor in the Environmental Health and Safety Office was appointed to the Governor's Pollution Prevention, or P2, statewide committee, which is charged with the task of looking at waste reduction strategies statewide. The front end approach of this committee is commendable. Interesting. I will say, I do know that, uh, while I don't know if there is a committee or coordinator or somebody in charge of this in this way today um, mo mainly because I've never really had a reason to go and look <clears throat> we do now have uh, lead certified buildings and like most of the new construction happening on campus is is done to uh, LEED environmental standards now um, so things have progressed, whether or not we actually have the, a coordinator like in the same fashion as that today. Um, so I just wanted to get like a little bit of background. And that gives us a little bit of background, I think, on stuff at Virginia Tech. I would love to share this. I just have to do it with some consideration because um, it's an email, which means it has uh, contact information in it. So I want to make sure I don't share that. Accidentally. <clears throat> Which I can do this way. Ba, 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 ba. Just going to like cover up the header information. Uh, I will tell you it is from Sarah Ketchum. Subject 30 Earth Days. Commentary. Looking back at 30 Earth Days. Um, the date on this was May 10th, uh, 2020. My brain wanted me to say 1920, although I knew that was wrong. And I don't know why the camera wishes to misbehave. I, I was gonna zoom in and make the text bigger, but something is uh, not functioning properly above my head. 
Yeah. Uh, the camera is being difficult. Hang on one second. I'm just going to turn it off and turn it back on again so that hopefully I can gain control over it. So we get to look at the lovely no signal, no signal, no signal. Also wobbly, sorry. Try to stabilize that just a little bit so it doesn't bounce around quite so much. Um, and let's see if I can get logged into it so that I can adjust the zoom. Anyway, while, while I attempt to do this, uh, feel free to read ahead. really just like when this camera goes down on me because it's like when it um, ceases functioning in the middle of stream because it has many steps to get it functioning correctly again. Um, there. <clears throat> Subject, 30 Earth Days. Commentary, Looking Back at 30 Earth Days by Danella H. Meadows. Um, who, let's see, was uh, an adjunct professor at Dartmouth College and director of the Sustainability Institute in Heartland, Vermont. So this was um, from Sarah Ketchum to the entire uh, college and University Recycling Coordinator list. Uh, so this came from a listserv to, um, and Larry actually like printed it. But uh, if in the 30 Earth Day celebrations since 1970, the human population and economy have become any more respectful of the Earth, the Earth hasn't noticed. Planets measure only physical things energy and materials and their flows into and out of the changing populations of living creatures. What the Earth sees is that on the first Earth Day in 1970, there were 3.7 billion of those hyperactive critters called humans. And now there are more than 6 billion. Really? Only? Oh wow, that's weird. Sorry, I was looking at the header and I was like, May 10th, 2020? That doesn't make any sense. This email is from 2000. Whatever uh, computing system that printed it um, had had a temporary patch, it looks like. Uh, actually, I can show that for sure. Um, this, to me, looks like whatever computer printed this uh, had had a temporary patch to continue functioning past Y2K. Um, so anybody who was alive at that time was very aware Y2K and the Y2K bug, where prior to the immediate lead up to the change from 1999 to 2000, computers were storing dates. They stored the year with two digits. And as we started to encounter dates that started with 2-0 instead of 19, and people would put in oh, t like 2002 or 2003, uh, looking at things off in the future, <clears throat> that would cause strange behaviors to happen because the computer would interpret those dates as 1902 and 1903. And so if you had programs that were calculating the difference between dates and you put the starting date 
in like 1998 and the ending date in 02, the computer would struggle with that because then you had a negative, uh, like a negative number as the result because it read it as 1902. Anyway, one of the strange behaviors that happened even with systems that got patches in them was that things like this would happen where it says 051020 for May 10th, 2000. Because this system, whatever printing system this was, only knew how to do two digits for the date, and so it pulled the first two uh, out of the four-year date that was being stored. Anyway, sorry. That is a complete tangent, but I saw it and thought it was interesting, so commented on it. Uh, okay, let's see. <clears throat> so, 1970, there were 3.7 billion. 2000, 6 billion. I wanna say, I haven't looked in a while, but I wanna say it's something more like 9 billion today. Nope. I'm a little over. Um, as of 2021, the population of the Earth uh, was 7.888 billion humans. <clears throat> in 1970, those humans drew from the Earth's crust 46 million barrels of oil per day. Now they draw 78 million. And again, that was 20 years ago that that, that statement of 78 million was being um, noted. I don't believe that number has gone down since. Um, Natural gas extraction has nearly tripled in 30 years, from 34 trillion cubic feet a year to 95 trillion. We mined 2.2 billion metric tons of coal in 1970. This year, we'll mine about 3.8 billion. Oh, I think all those numbers have only gone up since this email was written. The planet feels this fossil fuel use as the fuels are extracted and spilled and shipped and spilled and refined, generating toxics and burned into numerous pollutants, including carbon dioxide, which traps outgoing energy and warms things up. Despite global conferences and brave promises, what the Earth notices is that human carbon emissions have increased from 3.9 million metric tons in 1970 to an estimated 6.4 million this year. You would think that an unimaginably huge thing like a planet would not notice the one degree Fahrenheit warming it has experienced since 1970. But one degree is a big deal, especially since it is not spread evenly. The poles have warmed more than the equator, the winters more than the summers, the nights more than the days. <clears throat> that means that temperature differences from one place to another have been changing much more than the average temperature has changed. Temperature differences are what make winds blow, rains rain, ocean currents flow. All creatures, including humans, are exquisitely attuned to the weather. All creatures are noticing weather weirdness and trying to adjust by moving, by fruiting earlier or migrating later, by building up whatever protections are possible against flood and drought. The Earth is reacting too. Shrinking glaciers splitting off nation-sized chunks of Antarctic ice sheet, enhancing the cycles we call El Nino and La Nina. <clears throat> Since the first Earth Day, our global vehicle population has swelled from 246 million to 730 million. Air traffic has gone up by a factor of six, the rate at which we grind up trees to make paper has doubled to 200 million metric tons a year. We coax from the soil, with the help of strange chemicals, 2.25 times as much wheat, 2.5 times as much corn, 2.2 times as much rice, almost twice as much sugar, almost four times as many soybeans as we did 30 years ago. We pull from the oceans almost twice as much fish. 
With the fish, we can clearly see how the planet behaves when we push it too far. Fish become harder and harder to find. If they are caught before they are old enough to reproduce, if their nursery habitat is destroyed, if we scoop up not only the cod, but the capillin upon which the cod feeds, uh, the fish may never come back. The Earth does not care that we didn't mean it, that we promise not to do it again, that we make nice gestures every Earth Day. Diehard optimists will berate me for not reporting the good news, but it is mostly measured in human terms, not Earth terms. Average human life expectancy has risen since 1970 from 58 to 66 years. Uh, gross world product has more than doubled from 16 trillion to 39 trillion. Recycling has increased, but so has trash generation. So the Earth receives more garbage than ever before. Wind and solar power generation have soared, but so have coal-fired, gas-fired, and nuclear generation. In 1970, there were no cell phones or video players. There was no internet. There were no dot-coms. Nor was anyone affected with AIDS, of course. Uh, nor did we have to worry about genetic engineering. Third world debt was one-eighth of what it is now. Um, I'll just add a little codicil on there to the there were no dot-coms and uh, update that today to there was no cryptocurrency. Uh, driving huge heat generation in the Arctic Circle by farms of GPUs trying to calculate the next prime number so they can make more crypto. I mean, it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all that is beneath the notice of the Earth, all that, sorry, is beneath the notice of the Earth. The Earth sees that its species are vanishing at a rate it hasn't seen for 65 million years. That 40% of its agricultural soils have been degraded that half its forests have disappeared and half its wetlands have been filled or drained, and that despite Earth Day, all these trends are accelerating. <clears throat> Earth Day is beginning to remind me of Mother's Day, a commercial occasion upon which you buy flowers for the person who, every other day of the year, cleans up after you. Guilt assuaging, trivializing, actually dangerous. All mothers have their breaking points. Mother Earth does not soften hers with patience or forgiveness or sentimentality. Sorry, when I saw that and the whole reason that we were doing this stream today was that Earth Day is coming up this weekend, I just felt that reading that email was spot on with the point of the stream. Also, I, I thought it was interesting, and I hadn't really thought about, like, the, all of those numbers in a while. And, like I said, I think all of those numbers have gone up since that email was written. Um, let's see. Let's see what we've got. Otherwise, um, we're at 3.30. Looking to see what <clears throat> a management plan for recycling paper at Virginia Tech. That sounds potentially interesting. And then we'll get to videos and, and pictures and stuff like that. A management plan for recycling papers at Virginia Tech. For Dr. Richard uh, Vokuch. April 21st, 1991. In fulfillment of independent study recycling project. Interesting. This is by John F. Keeling III and John W. Polk. So this is not Bechtel. Still, I'm interested. I would like to know more. Gotta love pages where the ink's sticking together. Oh, old documents. 
Analysis of the current system of Virginia Tech Recycling, the committee headed by Larry Bechtel, whose aim is to develop a recycling program on campus. A truck is used each Friday to collect paper from buildings on campus. It is driven by a physical plant employee and staffed by student volunteers. Not even student employees, student volunteers. Wow. <clears throat> Wait, what was the date on this? Uh, 1991. So, which was before, I guess just after BTR started? Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> There's a current measurement system in place to track pounds of paper collected from each building and amount of money saved. So far, VTR has collected 50,715 pounds of paper and saved the university $482 in tipping fees alone. Uh, when other cost savings are included, this comes to $1,589. I'm uncertain what tipping fees are in this context. I assume something related to fees for dumping paper at the dump, but I'm not certain. I'm going completely off of context clues there. Uh, plan to expand the VTR paper route. We recommend the current route split to two routes. So the routes should be staffed by university employees. The waste should be separated. Buildings should receive feedback on their performance. Revenue data should be calculated to determine what VTR could gain if another organization were buying the paper. BTR has low overhead, employee and equipment costs could be incurred with expansion. Buildings need to choose a coordinator and a committee. The committee needs to analyze the waste stream, identify sources of waste, determine recyclable materials, locate collection sites, develop a program for collection, and coordinate with BTR for external collection. Recommendations for the university. Uh, buy recycled paper. Use recyclable products where non-recyclable products are now being used. Contact other universities. Make recycling convenient. Set goals. Make recycling part of the university employee's jobs. Encourage student projects. Identify ways to minimize waste. Develop a materials exchange system. All fairly common sense things, I think. So I'm curious about this, like, it's staffed by student volunteers? So that's what I want to know more about in, in looking at this. The VTR paper route. Virginia Tech Recycling, VTR, is a newly formed committee on campus. Not even a department, a committee. Uh, Larry Bechtel, the university's newly appointed recycling coordinator, heads the committee. Oh gosh, this sounds like how every department on campus starts, even today. He's responsible for administering and expanding the program. Currently, his position is only for 10 hours per week. However, Larry will be full-time this summer. The full scope of this position has yet to be determined. His office is currently at the physical plant. Just thinking about how huge running recycling for a campus this size would be and like one person who works 10 hours a week instantiated a committee and that was that was it like hey yeah we'll hire one person for 10 hours a week uh and then you know come summer they can they can start working full time it's a gigantic project. Oh my gosh. Um, VTR is currently managing a paper pickup on campus that includes 15 non-dormitory buildings. Attachment to uh, schedule. Larry's been the driver on the route and has relied on volunteers from EcoCycle, a volunteer organization on campus in charge of aluminum recycling. Okay, now I'm sad I didn't have time to digitize the VHS tape because it was about EcoCycle. Hi, Pablo Glam, welcome! The Wildlife Club and other independent volunteers to staff the truck. 
a physical plant employee is now driving the truck. Hey, so Larry doesn't have to drive the truck anymore. That's an improvement, I guess. Two major problems with the current route. No mechanism in place to ensure the paper route will be staffed by volunteers. No new buildings that want to be on, or sorry, there are new buildings that want to be on the route, yet the truck is at full capacity with the current buildings. And it takes them three hours to get through the buildings they're already serving. Wow. I just like, they hired somebody to coordinate recycling for a large re R1, Research One University. And they hired somebody to work 10 hours a week with no staff. And then apparently like by this point had decided they needed to work full time and gave them a little bit of assistance by having another physical plant employee drive the truck. But they were still like reliant on volunteers from student groups to actually get the work done. Not even student employees, like, wow. Wow. <laughs> we'll begin this section by stating our planning assumptions. We discuss the staffing needs of the current paper route. This includes staffing the collection truck and internal staffing in buildings. We discuss two proposals for expanding the current route and provide an alternative that combines the advantages of each. Staffing the paper route. This is the... I'm just... I shouldn't be surprised, but I am. Attachment five is an example of a sign-up sheet. A sign-up sheet to ensure paper collection will be staffed each week. You recall that being common back when you were a student, also the 90s. Students on the recycling team were volunteers. At the time, this was also pointed out as being a bit unreasonable. Like, I mean, part of my financial aid package when I was an undergraduate was um, work study. Uh, so I had a job. I, I was a student employee of the university by just because that was part of my financial aid package. But most places on campus, and I was at a tiny school, most places on campus then and now um, employ student employees to get stuff done if they need assistance from uh, lower paid, not necessarily skilled employees. I'm not saying unskilled. I said not necessarily skilled. Uh, oftentimes students are quite skilled at what they're doing. Um, anyway, here's, here's the example sign-up sheet. Oh my gosh. Um, the physical plant will provide a driver for the VTR truck each week. However, the problem of staffing the truck still exists. <clears throat> this sheet contains the faces for a team leader and volunteers. The team leader will be responsible for ensuring that four of the volunteers will show up. Sorry. We recommend making phone calls a day or two in advance. The purpose of the alternate slots is to have someone to replace a volunteer if they can't show up. Sign-up sheets must be developed for each new route. You can draw from SGA, EcoCycle, and other volunteer organizations on campus to help staff the route. We should tap service organizations first because they will be willing to participate without expecting monetary gains. These organizations also seek out service projects. The SGA is currently evaluating a proposal to create an environmental committee committee will consist of approximately 15 people. Just wow. Sorry. I, I don't know why I'm so dumbfounded by this. 
Uh, the other, another option is to contract with these organizations to staff the route for particular periods of time. At least then you know that they're going to actually happen. The best option, however, would be to staff the route using university employees. For example, physical plant employees and custodial staff. I mean, I'm sure they already have jobs. Um, and additional duties are probably not welcome because everybody's always overworked. But hiring people to do it seems like a good idea. Uh, this would provide security for VTR into the future. I would also allow VTR to work on expansion without having to devote part of its time to making sure the truck is fully staffed. Uh, the work done for VTR would lessen the burden on the custodial staff. Therefore, we recommend the custodial staff for this task. VTR work would also provide a nice change of pace from their everyday duties. Uh, I will just note, custodial staff are highly skilled workers who do not get nearly enough respect for the job that they do. And um, I would want a breakdown of how much will this reduce their actual workload? Because I doubt that it did. Um, so that statement of recommend the custodial staff for the job because recycling would lessen the burden on them, I don't believe that. Uh, so probably not ideal to suggest the, the, the custodial staff. Um, I, I don't know for certain I believe at this time, 91, I want to say custodians were hired, like, were employed by Virginia Tech for campus. I don't know for certain, though. I know there was a period of time where they were. I know there are some buildings on campus that still employ uh, custodians directly. Uh, the library is not one of them. Our custodians are provided by an external vendor. Um, we used to have internal, uh, like actual VT employees that, that did that work, but uh, not anymore. I don't know why they changed. Um, not, that, not that the vendor does a bad job. The, they seem to do just fine, except their staff turnover is quite fast. And so <clears throat> within the course of a semester, um, it's not uncommon for the custodial staff to forget that my office exists. And uh, then my trash doesn't get collected. <laughs> um, because my, my office is nicknamed Artlantis uh, by one of our students because um, I'm going to actually prep the video now. So give me one second. Uh, I'll give you something pretty to look at while I do. Um, it's, it's nicknamed Artlantis because uh, art, our art collection is stored in there and... Um, It is the room everyone always forgets about. So it is the lost room, uh, and the room where the art collection is stored. So Artlantis is the nickname that it gained. Uh, this is landfill snapshots from Gamma Beta Phi, Soil and Water Conservation, on Earth Day, 1995. Uh, so I'm just gonna have those photos sit there for a moment while I prep this video. Because I forgot I was gonna be sharing the video. I actually have four of them. Um, They're not hard to open, I just need to get them uh, 
linked into OBS so that I can share them with you. property here. The Legend of the Lost Room of VT! <clears throat> oh wow, that text is incredibly tiny from this distance. That's the one I want to start with first. really wish I could just, well, you know, it'll work this way, it's just less efficient than I had hoped. Uh, all right, are we ready for... video? So these videos that I'm about to share are from box two folder I think. Yeah, box two, folder three, which is just labeled floppy disks. So, um, I can show you the floppy disks and we can all marvel. Uh, although I will say that two of them are not floppy. In fact, none of them are floppy. But... Now you've seen all of the photos of the um, landfill work. Soil and water conservation. This was an Earth Day project in 95. Anyway, that was... Um, probably the least interesting folder of photos that I could have pulled out. Uh, I have others. So these are, the, the videos we're about to look at come from these. Two zip drives and one three and a half inch uh, floppy drive that were part of the collection that we received. Uh, there were some like PowerPoint slideshows and things like that in the collection, or on there, but um, the videos seemed of the most interest. And let me see here. Uh, let me just pause the music real quick. Hang on. So many moving parts when I want to share a video. Uh, let's go full screen, a little full screen. All right, here goes. Yeah, the save icon. I think you should be able to hear. Don't you think? Well, what do I do with it? It's empty. I'm done. But I'm not done with it. What's she doing? <gasps> cool bean. No plastic chip. It's the first step in recycling plastic. From there, 
Now what's she doing? I'm making the most of Earth's precious resources. So let's try this again, shall we? Hop off that way, please. Now you're on the winning team. Who was that masked woman anyway? That was Miss Wanda, the Earth Ranger. Ah. <clears throat> Hello, this is Coach Beamer. You know, there's nothing like a tailgate party right before a big game. Rain or shine, it's all about good friends and team spirit. So let's all pitch in and help keep our campus clean and green. Bag up your trash or put it in a barrel. And don't forget to recycle those cans and bottles. It makes sense and feels good, and it only takes a minute. Look for the maroon recycling igloos or flag down one of the recycling crews. Show some spirit. Recycle. <laughs> it's an amazing piece. Um, it, this is definitely a, like, television ad spot that I am 100% certain this actually played during Virginia Tech football games. I, I know nothing more about Miss Wanda the Earth Ranger. I want to know more. I have not had a chance to really dig through the papers to see if I can find any more. You miss campy 90s environmentalism. Um, I know, like, I want to know, like, did, did Wanda the Earth Ranger, uh, like, know Captain Planet? Like, she seems like she probably would know Captain Planet. Um, honestly, I think... I think this is an amazing little uh, TV spot. Um, and the fact that they were able to make this, after what we just read, like they went from a single person leading, or a single person working 10 hours a week to a program that was big enough and drew enough attention to get some sort of video production unit uh, interested in helping them make an ad. Uh, and the spot had freaking the, the football coach, the, the um, very, frame, very famous, here at least, I don't know how famous he is elsewhere, uh, coach Beamer, the, the VT football coach, doing voiceover at the end in support of it. Like, they went all out for this. And it was, uh, all in all, not, not bad production value. Yeah, like, this was not, honestly, bad at all for the 90s. The, the um, <clears throat> video file on the zip disk is minuscule. Um, so, uh, it, it's not super great quality in, like, this is the best, um, digitization of it because it's just a tiny, tiny file. Um, oh, I was going to try and look up the, um, uh, I have a couple more that I want to show, but. What is the resolution on this darn thing? Um, the dimensions of the video are 320 pixels by 240 pixels, which in no way would that have been the actual image size. So like the image quality that you're seeing here um, would have been much better. It doesn't have the hallmarks of like a local used car dealership ad. This seems much more professionally done than that. Uh, so, yeah. 
Oh my gosh, are you kidding? Searching for more info is challenging because apparently there was a Power Ranger named Wanda, confu confusing the Google results. Oh, that's funny. Um, I have not looked, oh, sorry. You, you get to see my desktop background there for a second, um, which is an old D&D &D party of mine. Uh, I, I haven't checked the finding aid. Also, the only reason I found this video was um, I needed items for a cl an in-class activity in um, fall of 2020. And so I was looking at, we, we weren't back in the building, I couldn't digitize anything myself, so I was looking for things that were already digitized and I came across this and it was amazing. Um, let's see, what else do we have here in these videos? Well, let's pick, sure. Let's go for this one. Um, again, it's gonna be a tiny, tiny video that's that I'm just gonna like full screen, and so it, the resolution's not gonna be great. But uh, this one is, I believe, titled First Roll Off. Yeah. I'm not 100% certain where they were dropping that off. It's what it said on the tin, indeed. Um, I, but looking at, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure where that is. It's near, I can see the, the smokestack of the power plant in the background over here. Um, so that might be like the Moyer area. I'm not certain where on campus that is from this perspective. And this would have been at least 20 years ago. So campus has changed quite a bit in that time. But anyway, um, I've got two more little videos like that. Not necessarily the same. Untitled program. This will be fun, I'm sure. Uh, da, 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 da. This one. Make it big. 11 seconds. This must be the paper route in operation with the student volunteers. That's my best guess. 11 seconds, untitled program. Um, but yeah, my guess is that that is students uh, co going around collecting materials to be recycled. Um, we'll just do the last video here. which says, Brian talking. So I'm assuming his name is Brian. We had Larry's uh, current route, which, which involves 14 buildings. John and I just recently uh, developed um, a map that uh, takes care of about 32 different buildings, and that's gonna involve two routes. So we're gonna be expanding um, the route again we're going to be splitting it and that's going to involve two different schedules with two different drivers and, and two different teams of people that pick up the paper.
So, some interesting little, like, just little clips. I don't know that anybody will ever really want to look. It, it definitely with some talking. Like, I don't know how much use people are going to get out of just those little clips, especially the ones with no words. But kind of interesting, I guess. That said, this one is the bee's knees. And I feel should be played one more time. Resources. Oh, sorry. So let's try this again, shall we? Let's go. We, we don't have to start at the like full start. Let's let's take it from uh, take it from Wanda's entrance here. The the whip. Fan, you can recycle that. This? Why? Because it took millions of years to make the petroleum it took to make that bottle. And thousands of years before it finally decomposes in a landfill. Only so you can enjoy 20 ounces of pokey water. That's a pretty high price the Earth pays for your moment of refreshment, don't you think? Well, what do I do with it? I love the it's plug for pokey water. But I'm not done with it. What's she doing? <gasps> cool bean. No plastic chip. It's the first step in recycling plastic. From there. Now what's she doing? I'm making the most of Earth's precious resources. So let's try this again, shall we? Pop off that one, please. Now you're on the winning team. Who was that masked woman anyway? That was Miss Wanda, the Earth Ranger. Ah. <laughs> he says ah like he knows. Oh, this is you know, there's nothing like a tailgate party. But right that was clarification in that. Rain or shine, it's all about good friends and team spirit. So let's all pitch in and help keep our <laughs> campus clean and green. Bag up your trash or put it in a barrel. And don't forget to recycle those cans and bottles. It makes sense and feels good. And it only takes a minute. Look for the maroon recycling igloos or flag down one of the recycling crews. Show some spirit. Recycle. Anyway. I enjoy having that in our collection. I enjoy sharing it. Someday, I'm going to enjoy learning about Miss Wanda, the Earth Ranger. Um, I'm very curious as to whether there's anything more about her in the collection. Uh, there's nothing on the finding aid, but that isn't listed on the finding aid. So... Someday I may get a chance to actually like research it and see if I can find more. Why are they inside of the bin? Why not pop behind it? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know why, why Wanda the Earth Ranger ended up inside the recycling bin instead of beside it. Although, I do think that at the time that that was made, that those recycling bins were brand new, so probably less disgusting than it would have been uh, a season later. Um, <clears throat> there are various photographs and some slides in here, and I don't know what they all are, but I thought it'd be interesting to look and see if any of them are interesting. Um, we've got some landfill photographs from 1993. Um, 
I don't know how interesting these will be, but if you've never seen a landfill, you might learn. This does not, to me, look like a very active landfill. Also, like this is, I don't know where this is, uh, I don't know. It looks like a power plant, but it's not. It's, it's, there's too much like vegetation nearby. Um, oh yeah. Uh, you can see here uh, the raised portion of ground is old landfill. that's old enough that it's got grass on top of it. I don't know why it's that shape, particularly, but... Um, it, it just, all it said for these was landfill photographs. So that's like all I know. Um, yard waste processing too ground organic materials only. Brush, grass clippings, leaves. Absolutely no metal, glass, plastic, or rubber. Okay. So I, I don't know what the purpose is here. I would be curious to know if anybody knows more about like the function of landfills or like the operation of landfills, um, why they've got pillars put in place. I could speculate. And it looks like they're it looks like they're putting, um, so they've got some logs down on the sides too. I wonder if they're building like walls that are going to encompass an area where stuff will be filled in. I'm not, I'm not certain about that one. Got a trash moving machine for filling landfill. I at least know that much. They're not very detailed, and as far as I have found, th there's no, like, descriptions. Which is, sadly, not uncommon. When you get photos in a collection, quite often there are photos like this where there is no context other than these were labeled landfill photos. Why was this photo, like, what were they showing? What was this a photo of? What was the purpose of it? I don't know. Um, and it's possible the person who took it, or whose collection this is, also doesn't know, or does not, doesn't remember, but, and today, it's really easy to end up with tons of photos that have no purpose because you can take a hundred of them in a second um, and you don't have to worry about film. At least when these were taken, people didn't want to waste a photo because that was film and once used could not be undone and reused. Old corrugated cardboard truck at Wallace Child Development Labs photographs, uh, March 
So, I mean, it looks just like a dump truck. Because it is literally just like a dump truck. But this was the corrugated cardboard truck, apparently, in 1999. And this was at a child development lab's place, so there are just people, I guess, that were students there. Uh, so the, based on the like background images, and I don't know for certain, this says at Wallace Child Development Lab, which I believe is on the opposite side of campus from where I am. I was going to name a cardinal direction, but I honestly have no idea what direction that is. I think it's west of, of the library. <laughs> One of them actually has writing on the back. Cardboard truck driver Tim Chason. Or Chasson. Uh, I think Tim Chason. Uh, with Little Boy near Wallace Hall Child Development Center, I had been asked if we could send one of the trucks by for the children to see about 1996. Aw, that's. That seems like a 96 thing to do. Like, oh, this is the Child Development Center, and what's a fun activity for the kids? Let's let them see the, um, the recycling truck. That would be really fun and exciting. Um, and indeed, probably was at the time. to be mindful of the time. I have a guide to some of the photos, um, particularly the ones that are in slide form rather than photograph form. So we might move on to those next. I don't know if, how interesting all of this is to everybody, but I, I find it's making me think of the late 90s and uh, recycling stuff. Like all the like recycling programs and conservation type things that we did in, uh, talked about in school in the, the like, late 90s. Uh, come on. So, we're going to be looking at some slides, and I have this to attempt to light them from behind for you, uh, because, you know, that's how things work, right? Oh, but also there's, those were the photos I think that I was trying to find earlier. It's fine though. We can always look at them in a few minutes. Yeah. I've been looking for those. I didn't write down which folder they were in. <clears throat> I just knew photographs. All right, so I have uh, a document here that the folder it's in is just labeled a guide to the slides. So we might actually know what's in the slides. Uh, which is unusual. Often we get the slides and, I don't know, they're just slides, just like the photos. But this time we actually have some information. Um, and <laughs> for handling slides, I am putting gloves on. Uh, so, let's see. Um, well, there are a couple of options here. We have VRA November 1998 Carousel. Tom's Creek Basin Facility Creating Green Space Presentation. Um, ba -ba 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 
pa 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 BRAA, Blacksburg Regional Art Association Presentation Carousel, it covered early stages of development of VTR and end with slides on the collaborative art projects with art professor Steve Bickey, or Bickley at the VT Landfill. Okay, that sounds interesting to me. Let's see what we can find. Um, they are indeed not actually in carousels anymore. And I will do my best to try and present them in the proper sequence, but I don't know that I will. Because, you know, I didn't make the slideshow. <laughs> Looks like the earliest one I have in here is slide three. Let's see how good I do at Let's try and zoom in. Ha-ha! <laughs> That's about as good as I could do. I don't think I could go any further. Like, it, it doesn't zoom anymore. Um, the presentation and accompanying slides were relevant for BRAA members, and I, too, was a member because my approach to developing the program was based on my paradigm as working artists, namely that I could take whatever materials were available to me and from them construct something meaningful, functional, and enduring. Also at work uh, was a sustainability ethic. So, let us... I'm actually going to take one second and load this up with a bunch of slides and then we can just skip through it, right? This is actually a frame for digitizing slides, and I just um, borrowed it for showing slides on stream. Thankfully, these aren't negatives, which I probably would have had to digitize ahead of time instead of just showing live. What am I doing? I'm doing silly things. Hi. I'm your, your local friendly archivist here, and uh, I am vamping while I try not to destroy materials that I am putting into a framework to make them available for you all to see. Um, how are you all doing? I hope that you're enjoying the program so far. Um, I, so far, have thought that these are somewhat interesting. I'm glad I picked this collection for uh, featuring Near Earth Day, because um, honestly I had not really thought about um, the particulars of the history of our recycling program much before. But I think it's sort of kind of amazing to like get the opportunity to learn about like the history of it and the fact that um, it started with one employee who worked 10 hours a week. That is just astounding. I don't think I can do sideways. Oh, that worked. I don't know how uh, familiar, I don't know how familiar everybody is with slides, actual like frames of film that used to go into carousels and be projected onto, uh, onto screens uh, to torture people with your vacation photos or 
uh, give lectures or, you know, various purposes like that. Um, <clears throat> I only have the one sheet of the, that is labeled as the BRAA presentation. Uh, the date on it is February 23rd, 2003. And these are the slides that are part of that sheet. Um, it's funny, I have to move the entire light box. Uh, I, now I can move like the slide frame, but it, I needed to move the whole light box to get like in position for the top row to be visible for you all. Uh, let's get this positioned and <clears throat> I do not know which slide, like that looks to me like number three, but I don't know for certain. Um, the notes that I have here, a BRAA, Blacksburg Regional Art Association Presentation Carousel, February 23rd, 2003. In this presentation, I covered early stages of development of VTR and end with slides on the collaborative art projects with art professor Steve Bickley at the VT Landfill. Um, and then I have like notes here, slide 74. I am shown here beside flatbed truck VT-22, proudly showing off my load of 44 peanut pack boxes. I don't know where that slide is. So I'm gonna, we'll go through and, I mean, I, let's see if I can figure out. Trying to figure out what the content of this slide might be. I don't know what number it is. It's a person standing next to a, a truck with roll-up sides that has a bunch of cardboard boxes on it. I don't know, that could be the 44 peanut boxes, I have no idea. Uh, let's see. It would take a little bit of re researching, I think, to, because some of them have numbers on them and some of them don't. And some of those numbers, yeah, but, but, but like the ones that have numbers, those numbers aren't in the notes that accompanied the slides. So I am uncertain. Um, that looks like an Easter Island head. Apart from that, I have no idea. If it weren't for the path, I would say that looks like the turf grass center, but um, I don't know. Ah, no. I thought for a second I, I had the description that went with the slide, but no. Um, Huh. I'm trying to find out. Because it seems like... Okay, so there's... Um, couple of possibilities for description. So this is definitely an art installation. Uh, this slide is 
sideways. So this presentation was all about using found materials and uh, stuff that would have been landfill, would have been thrown away, uh, to make art. And um, so we have a couple of examples of some of the art that was made. And this is one of those, from what I can tell. Um, there's a description here. I don't have numbers. Neither of the ones that I'm going to show here have numbers. I wish they had numbers that corresponded with this. But the description says, uh, in what seems like it might be relevant, Um, the ultimate in art making, creating a full-scale Native American earth mound. No, wait, that's got to be this one. See if the slides will tell us a story, and then I can look at descriptions. Anyway, we've got... That just looks like somebody recycling to me. I don't know. Uh, some cardboard boxes. We have the... Installed... Or the, the art formation of what looks like an Easter Island head on the ground there. I don't, I don't know for certain. This looks like, this is probably just like a uh, wood chip or a various other mulch type product being used to form paths. Um, I don't know where though. Could be the golf course, but I'm not certain. Uh, we've got a truck. Definitely dropping off a heck ton of mulch. I don't know. There is a description about a front end loader. This is not a front end loader, though. So this is not, that's not the description here. There's definitely one about mulch, but I don't know. I was so excited to have descriptions for the slides. And somehow none of the descriptions line up to the slides. I am so confused. Uh, I'm wondering, there might be more slides for this set, and in fact, there must need to be. Because none of these seem relevant to anything that's going on. Oh, hey, look. They're making the path. They're using that um, construction equipment there to deposit and move the mulch material that, in this slide, it has darkened and, but, oh wait, that's not just, that's not a path. That is a, um, that's a human shape. Oh, that's that. I know what that is. I know what it is. Oh, I need to, uh, I think, I think it's in the photos here. Um, cause I, so there's mention in the description here. I'll, I'll read for you. Um, 
the ultimate in art making, creating a full-scale Native American earth mound using the brand new tub grinder uh, and physical plant trucks and drivers. The truck is shown dumping the mulch into the earth mound shape, which has been lined out by our professor Steve Bickey, or Bickley using a football field lining device borrowed from the athletics department. So um, I believe this is them like using equipment to fill the thing, to fill the shape. Um, completed earth mound we called turtle mound. It's seen from the end of the tail toward the body. I don't know for certain if any of these slides are it. At best, this might be it, but I don't think it is. Um, but this here and this, these are the beginnings of a second earth mound, much larger than Turtle Mound, which we called Flying Man. This project went on for months and perhaps over a year was the climax of the environmental art concept for TCBS and of my collaboration with Steve Bickley. Uh, and then local teacher Ann Roberts brought out her students one day to see the earth mounds. Her students are visible on both Flying Man and Turtle Mound. So that's who those people are that are standing on the very flat thing there. I, I swear there was a photo. I know I've seen a photo of uh, the two of them from the air. Where that photo is located, though, is um, possibly somewhat more difficult. I'm going to quickly go and see if it's in here. Boop, boop, ba -doo. I mean, these photos are worth looking at anyway, which I would do. I just realized, wow, it's already 4.30. Um, huh, time flies when you're doing many things. I don't know. I do not know where this photo has gone. Um, for now, here's a photo of the uh, little recycling bin that we saw Wanda the Earth, uh, uh, Wanda the Earth Ranger, er, in uh, while I uh, see it might have been digital that I. See. That photo. Oh no, that won't work. Without. Oh no, it should work. No. I'm. One second. I'm just gonna do a quick check and see if maybe the photo I'm thinking of was already like a digital photo, uh, which is possible. Because if not, I'm not certain where it is and I'm not going to be able to find it today. Um, we're in RG6. had some of these photos backwards, it looks like. Oh, we got some of them now. Uh-huh, okay. It is, I don't, I don't know where they are physically, but I have them digitally. So I'm gonna grab the couple of photos that I want to, you know, finish what we were just looking at with the earth mounds. There, that one, that's what I was thinking of. Yes! Yes! Uh, I will actually show them to you in a, in a moment. Because um, there are a couple of 
really... Now I have contacts. I know what they are. It's really... Okay. Um, we shall start with... Don't get to use any of my gestures because it makes things weird. Okay. <sighs> Let me uh, share screen again real quick. We will bring in a photo. Thank you, OBS. I appreciate you. Really, really, I do. Uh, 8, 11, and 13. Well, it's, you're going to see my, uh, my background again real quick, because I don't know how else to do this. Um, that this will work. Okay, there's one. Uh, this is the aerial shot I was thinking of. Um, so you can see there... The turtle mound is on the right. It looks to me more like a guitar than a turtle. Um, and then Flying Man. They've got the outline for Flying Man. There. Um, and then if I pull in this one, there are the students on top of standing on um, the turtle mound with the picture being taken from the tail end uh, which is looks to me like the fretboard of the guitar but um, that is definitely the earthworks that they were making so yeah um, I'm gonna just like throw up one other picture this is not of the earthworks um, I'm gonna leave this one up here while we wind down the stream and look for, you know, somewhere that we're going to go. But um, these are some of the student volunteers for Virginia Tech Recycling uh, in the 90s. And they've got, that looks to be the roll-up side truck that we saw in some of the other photos. And that building that they are pulled up to looks like, that looks like the loading dock of the library. Uh, which is why I decided to just throw it up as the ending. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I believe that um, coming up next week, we are back to our high energy physics series. Um, so the stream next week is actually focused on nuclear winter. I have materials from two different nuclear winter um, focused conferences. And so uh, that's what we're going to look at next week. I, uh, beyond that, I don't really know what's in them. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, I think we are going to reverse things this week. And we instead of being raided by 16-Bit Eric, we are going to raid 16-Bit Eric. I know. Things are 
strange uh, for me to be actually raiding Eric. But <laughs> thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I hope that this was interesting. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of your week and that you enjoy Earth Day on Saturday. Um, and hopefully I'll see you again for another um, archive stream. These are weekly on Wednesdays. And uh, yeah, hopefully it was good. Hopefully I see you again. Um, until then, keep exploring history, everybody.